Well, hello, everyone. Today I'm joined by a Boyd, but it's not Dan. It's his wife, Regina, because <laughs> we are here talking about her new book, Leaving Loneliness Behind, published by Ave Maria Press. Regina, thanks so much for making the time to be on our podcast. Thank you for having me. I mean, come on. It's about time, right? <laughs> I know. Well, you know, we're getting near the end of the season, and then we were looking for another interview. and like, Dan, your wife just wrote an amazing book. We need to talk to her. So <laughs> I am uh, really excited about this conversation because, as you know, um, I couldn't get enough of your book. And um, let's start, though, with this. Let's start, though, with this question of what, where did this book come from? Why did you write it? And why do you think this topic of leaving loneliness behind is so pressing this day and age? I've always been interested in relationships, you know, one of one of the things I do, I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist, and it's something that I feel like in general is really important. But part of what happened with the book was um, I had given a talk about emotional connection, emotional intimacy for married couples, and, you know, happened to have a conversation with someone who works at Ave Maria Press, and they just sort of floated that question, you know, have you ever thought about writing a book that's a really interesting topic? So that sort of began the wheels turning of, of discernment and thinking about, you know, actually that, that could, there could be something there. Um, and so I just, I just think the timing, you know, the Lord's providence, but I think the timing is wonderful in this post COVID world of thinking about, um, how we've had to reintegrate into society after all of the isolation, all of the quarantining. And really, I remember moments where people were initially scared to be back in contact with one another and asking those questions of, you know, what do I do when I pass someone on the sidewalk? Should I say hello? Should I not? Do I have to keep six feet distance? Do I? And I just, what about the sign of, these, of peace? How should I handle right? the sign of peace? <laughs> Exactly. All of these little things that we were sort of relearning of how do we socialize now in this post pandemic world. And so I think it's beautiful timing to really reflect on the value of relationships, why they're important, why we should be making them a priority for our own mental, emotional well being, but also just to remember that that connection is ultimately what one of the things we're made for. We can't survive without it. Now, I couldn't agree more. And what I loved about the book, well, A, it's short. I'm not a big reader. Your husband will tell you that. <laughs> it's digestible. It's practical. And like I was telling you before we started recording, I'm not someone that ever took time to study relationships. I think like most people, we think, you know, I'll just figure it out. I have plenty of good friendships. I got this relationship thing. But reading your book, I'm like, oh, my goodness, I have so much to learn. And why haven't I taken the time previously to study what makes for healthy relationships? I think it would save us all a lot of grief to just spend a little bit of time thinking about how do we do this right? How do we have deep, meaningful relationships? You are hitting on one of my mini soapboxes. If, if I were to pick one to stand on, this is one. And I feel like I feel like that's just been my whole life as a therapist is shouting about the importance of relationships and no one listens. Everyone says the same thing. One of my really close friends, I was telling when I was first writing the book, I, I had mentioned how one of the chapters would be about communication. And she made this kind of joking side comment of like, I communicate with my husband every day, you know. That's like, in the book too, right? Right. I mean, you yeah. I think, about okay. Yeah. I think it did put on book. Yeah. And mm -hmm. um, she, uh, you know, I just thought it was really funny because I, you know, one, people define that word differently. Um, they don't realize all of the layers and the nuances in our communication with one another and what it what it really means. Um, but but just the idea, just like you said, just because we have friends, just because we have family, doesn't mean that we're communicating well or in a healthy way or in a beneficial way, and it doesn't mean that we are automatically experts either. Now, what you hit on well in the book for me, too, is are you getting the most out of your relationships? Because we can have lots of good relationships, but good to who? These these relationships, like our relationship with God, can go endlessly deep. So how much do you want to make of those relationships? So so we're sharing now we're sharing the soapbox a little bit, I guess, Regina. It'll become <laughs> a mini one. I've recommended your book to several people since I've read yeah. it. But um, why don't we um, 
talk about this now. You know, this is an evangelization podcast, so hopefully this evident this um, answer is kind of self evident. But what does having deep, meaningful relationships have to do with evangelization and and sharing the gospel? I mean, you can't share the gospel without having a relationship with someone, um, or at least share it well. Um, and I, when I think about my own faith journey and all the ways that I've grown and deepened in my faith, it was because of, it was a relationship or connection to another person, somebody who was willing to sit with me and answer my questions about the faith, someone who I trusted, who recommended a book to me that I actually wanted their mm -hmm. recommendations, mm -hmm. um, you know, s presenters, speakers, people to list podcasts. There were so many people along the way that really helped to develop my faith and help me learn and grow. And it, if without those connections, you know, I don't think um, I can't attribute me being where I am today without them, honestly. And so I think relationships are foundational to evangelization. Um, we can't express uh having a relationship with God if without having a relationship with another person. We can't invite somebody into that relationship without modeling it in some way ourselves, but living it in a true, authentic way. Yeah. And, you know, I think for me, this book is an answer to prayer too, because, um, you know, Dan will tell you, Dan, Dan will tell you about this, this about me too, is I'm very practical and a lot of um, talk in the church lately has been about things that are very theoretical, accompaniment, listening, relational ministry. What does that mean? But your book is actually a practical how-to guide of, okay, here's how you actually build rapport with someone, show them you care, listen to them so you can bring the good news, um, which starts by just plain old love in them, right? Right. And, and you can uh, accompany them in the true sense of accompaniment. So it, it is very, it makes something very, abstract for many of us relationships and gives us concrete things we can do to have better relationships with family, with friends, with coworkers, strangers, even all sorts of folks. Absolutely. There really has to be something to apply there. Yes. Yeah, so let's talk about, these are some of my favorite tidbits, but please, okay. please uh, throw in any of, of yours that you would like to talk about. But one thing I really appreciate hearing about, you know, I'm a parent and I'm always thinking, am I being too hard? Am I being too soft? And you said research says that to the best relationships tend to have a five to one ratio, five positive interactions with one negative interaction. Can you explain why you think that math uh, works out so well? Yeah, so um, they did this research with couples. So I'll, I'll say, I'll put that caveat out there, but um, they actually did longitudinal studies, actual peer reviewed validated research where they were studying couples over time and couples who rated themselves as being happier in their marriages, more satisfied, they had a literal five to one ratio of positive versus negative. So regular happy exchanges versus an argument or some type of disagreement. And when couples were close to that range, they rated themselves higher in overall satisfaction. So pretty much if you can remember anything, the five to one ratio, you're pretty much gonna have a happy friendship, marriage, whatever it is. Um, parenting is interesting now that you mention that. Um, there's um, some other research as well that talks about uh, being the good enough parent. Mm -hmm. And I, I feel like it gives a lot of hope to parents because we're constantly agonizing about being good enough for our kids and making sure we're helping them grow and feel loved and cared for. And um, I believe, you know, when kids are young and in that infant and toddler stage, it was really about the responsiveness uh, for that child to grow into a, an overall healthy kind of well-rounded individual. Um, the parents only had to respond correctly, whether, you know, if the baby's crying and they need a diaper change, a bottle, it's too hot, it's too cold. The parents only had to respond correctly to the cries about 60% of the time. <laughs> That's great news. I think I can it's do that. Great news, right? Exactly. So when you hear that, it's like, okay, I can do that because we hold ourselves to such these high standards. Oh, oh amen. Um, and, but when you put it in that sense, okay, 60%, five to one, I can do that. I can sort of count and make, have this sense that, yeah, more often than not, our interactions are generally positive and fruitful. And that's a sign that we're going in a healthy direction. And one thing I appreciate too, in the, the book, you talk about why that 
you might think, well, why any negative? Well, if you're only positive people, you're not helping people grow, right? Because um, who who really truly wants that friend that's just the yes friend? I mean, my best friends in life have been the ones that lift me up, encourage me, but also tell me when I'm a little off the mark and I need some correction. And those are the deep relationships, right? Deep relationships don't come from just yes people and always agreeing. Right. Um, and because they gave you that correction, they did, probably gave it to you in a loving way, in a way you could receive it well. You had already had the foundation of a solid friendship so that you were willing to receive their feedback. Um, but also it proves how strong your friendship is because you survived that challenging conversation. You navigated that really well. A amen. Amen. Okay, here's my second one. Okay. I mean, the relationship roadmap. What a clear way of how to think about a relationship. You know, it's like a map, right? And think about how much can you fill in that map? And if you think about it, like, let's just think about, it could be for a spouse, it could be a coworker, but if you can't list their favorite hobbies, their, their, um, their favorite movies, uh, what they like, where they like to go to eat, the things that matter to them, you don't have a good roadmap to success in a relationship. So I love the relationship roadmap because it gives me like a visual. And if I wanted to, I could even try to chart it in for the key people in my life and see, well, where do I need to do some like basic icebreaker questions with the people that I consider very close to me, but I can't even name their favorite movie. So love the roadmap, Regina. Yeah, it's always a fun, uh, like you said, icebreaker conversation starter when you're just hanging out bored at a restaurant one day. Let's start going through some of these questions. Um, I'm always in awe that every now and then my daughter will just kind of randomly say something like, oh, mommy, you really like this. You know, you really love this food item. And I'm, it always catches me off guard. Like, wow, she really pays attention <laughs> um, even when it doesn't seem like it right in little kid world. Um, and it reminds me that I need to make sure that I'm also paying attention to her um, as well as she's paying attention to me. Yeah, kids are a lot better at these things naturally. Would you agree with that? Oh, yes, absolutely. They what sort of think? intuit the they intuit love with getting to know someone and truly wanting to know them in an oh, intimate way. Absolutely. So what do you think? Well, you talk about this quite a bit in the book, but what are those things that happen to us along the way that when we're grown ups, we're not as good at this? Yeah, I think we get so burdened with all of our responsibilities. Um, it's just harder to have time for play and for fun because of all the things we're juggling. And so we don't have that freedom that children have to be free to imagine, to be to be as creative all the time. And so it's important for us to remember to try to schedule those things in. And even scheduling it in sounds a little less childlike, right? <laughs> but sometimes you have to work with what you have. Um, I think it's okay to schedule things in because because at least it's happening. Um, but uh, yeah, I think there's just some uh, disposition of openness and reckless abandon that children have that we can learn from as far as being vulnerable and close to others. Yeah, and another place you go deep deep in the book too, though, is is about these wounds we pick up along the way, things that happen to us, and how to train ourselves to to heal from those things, to think differently about them. So, so I really appreciated that as well, because whether we want to acknowledge it or not, there's things that have happened to us in the past that are affecting the way we're building relationships now. Absolutely. Absolutely. And if we're not aware of that, then we can fall into the same pitfalls again in our newer friendships newer relationships. And so awareness is key in one, being able to do anything about it. And two, to make, making sure we can make adjustments so mm -hmm. that we're not falling into those same traps. Well, again, your book's very practical and it helped me immediately with certain things. You talk about how, you know, a conversations, and this is stuff some of our listeners may have heard at ad nauseum, but for some of us, this is new things. Just thinking about how you start a conversation is how you're going to end a conversation. So if you're going into a difficult conversation, even at work, enter in calm, stay calm. And you also talk about how pay attention to times where your signs of anxiety are starting to show. So you're training us how to almost be a self therapist to a certain extent, right? It's like, okay, when that person made that comment or looked at you that way, it caused your heart rate to go up, or it made you nervous and later to reflect, 
okay, why did that happen? What might be mm-hmm. going on underneath that? And you can maybe trace it back to something years ago, right? And and begin the healing process. So again, it's all very practical. It's taking these these theoretical things and, and making it concrete. Yeah, because so much so much of that happens in a split second. You're in the middle of that discussion, your heart rate goes up and you're just reacting. You don't have time to think about, wow, how has this impacted me from five years ago? You know, you're just reacting. And so it's important to take that time to reflect after the fact in the heat of the moment. You know, that's pretty much impossible unless we've done some practice over time. Um, But uh, making sure we reflect when we're calm and everything, the dust has settled to really think back and do a proper examine, if you will, and say, you know, what's what's going on here? Where 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 went, where was I being influenced in positive ways or less positive ways? Yeah, that's another connection to the faith, the, the Ignatian examine, and why that can be so helpful to recognize the graces, but also where we've fallen short. Um, you know, in the book, you talked about um, when you identify this trigger, different ways to self-soothe, slow down your breathing. Um, do you have any other concrete ways people can strategies people can implement when they're in the middle of a stressful situation, just how to calm down in the moment. So later they can do that deeper reflection, you know, and not have that blow up moment in that tough meeting or conversation. That's a tough one. I, I, I definitely think breathing is probably the number one go-to if you really want in the heat of the moment, slow, deep breaths, not shallow breaths, because then we're hyperventilating and getting our heart rate higher. Mm -hmm. (laughs) But, um, physiologically your body doesn't have a choice, but to slow down Mm. Um, when we're doing those slow, deep breaths. So even if your mind's racing, you're feeling anxious, the deep breaths will at least force your body to slow down, your heart rate to slow Mm. and calm. And then you can kind of catch up to that mentally. Absolutely. That makes sense. And the combination that shows just the connectedness of our emotions with our physical body, with our, with our spirituality, it's all connected. So one more, and again, this is one of those ones that sounds basic, maybe, you know, Someone like your friend might have laughed at this. But here's the thing. I think all these concepts are easy to understand, but hard to implement. So one more I want to highlight is that act of deep listening, because you talk about in the book, conversations are really about values. So, mm. and, and our popes talked a lot about this, but how do we, how do we listen all the way through what someone wants to say, not thinking about what we're going to say next? Because if we, if we really listen, we can hear the values they're speaking about. We can hear their heart if we really listen. It's so amazing to me how quickly a conversation can get away from us and how we, again, we're responding. We we kind of get triggered. We're having our own internal response and reaction. And then we start interpreting the other person through that lens. And everything is just sort of discolored in a way that we, they're forever coming at us, you know, they're coming after us, they're trying to do something. And it really helps the, it doesn't help the conversation move forward, it falls flat, because we are, because we have that lens and that filter, we're missing an opportunity to really get to the heart of what someone's trying to communicate. When I think back in my own life, of disagreements I've had with people, it, and you really reflect, and you say, what happened there? It's, it just ultimately comes back to a miscommunication that you were each trying to say something the other person didn't understand. It's as if you were speaking two different languages, Mm -hmm. the message didn't land and it wasn't received. And so I think the the best thing we can do is try to slow the conversation down. Yes. And that's so hard to do when the adrenaline flows. Yeah. Yeah. You, you talk in the book about not reacting, listening, but also the use of I statements and making sure you're you're understanding what the other person is saying even before responding. So it's it's basic skills, things we've we've maybe heard before in a communication right. workshop or something like that. But like any skill, you have to keep practicing it or you're gonna get a little rusty. Right. In order to be a good listener, we have to know what the person shared with us before we respond. So some type of general summary of re- repeating back what you heard them say is going to go really far to frame how you want to respond instead of just interpreting it through my lens and my filter and unfortunately sending the conversation down the wrong track. So 
if any, a good general rule of thumb is just, if, if anything, just repeat back what you think you heard them say. It gives you an opportunity to digest and really come to a full understanding, mm -hmm. but it gives the other person an opportunity to clarify in case what you repeat back to them when they hear it, there's, they say, well, no, actually, that's not what I'm trying to say. I was trying to say this. So it's this great opportunity for more clarification so that you're on the same page and hopefully more fruitful, more productive, more open with one another. Absolutely. Because how many times do we think we heard them, but we're already putting a spin on what they said and it wasn't exactly. really what they intended. Exactly. Yeah. Well, um, one thing we certainly need to talk about how this book does a great job of connecting to our faith throughout the book. It's very Eucharistic. How did you go about making all those connections as you were writing the book? You know, it's it's sort of things that I've thought of over the years. That, you know, it depends. Um, I've, I feel like there's so much overlap between the field of psychology, therapy, and the church in general. And even when I was in grad school, there was just so much richness there that I noticed. One common example that I give is the dignity of the human person. Uh, we as therapists are trained to respect all people um, regardless of their backgrounds, their affiliations. And so for me, I start hearing, you know, dignity of the person, Catholic social teaching, you know, it's just very clear, even though it's written in a secular language. So all of our ethical codes, our boards are, you're obligated to treat people in a certain way and expected to. Um, and so for me, there was, it was just kind of uh, this fun to kind of tease those things out. No, thank you for helping us see those connections. And yeah, they're so apparent once you you think about scripture with that lens and the relationships uh, we see Jesus developing with, with the apostles and even the more intimate group of Peter, James, and John. Yeah, if you start to look at scripture and the gospels, especially with the lens of relationship, you can see really good uh, examples from Christ for how to do this, how to listen. And he always asks good questions, right? So, um, he asked great questions. Yeah, he was, he was definitely a good listener. He threw some zingers out there, but he was <laughs> a great listener as well. And I think that's what helped him to be able to provide such good teaching. But yeah, um, some of those, uh, reflections I think I had I had read from someone else in the past and that sort of stuck with me as well. Yep, yep. Um, so uh, I guess to wrap up, Regina, you know, what do you really want listeners to know uh, just about relationships in general and the difference healthy relationships can make in their lives? I'll go back to the basics that we're designed for relationships. So the same way we need food, shelter, clothing, I'm going to add relationships, real authentic connections to that list. We're designed to live and be in community. We have a God who exists in relationship as a trinity, three in one. And so this is kind of what we're made if we're made in God's image and likeness. And so when we live our relationships well, when we're intentional, when we're thoughtful, when we listen well, when we're vulnerable, we really are enhancing that deeper connection and being more Christ-like, more in the image of God, and therefore being more of who we're called to be, and therefore more fulfilled and getting the most out of our life. And when we do our relationships well, we also help others experience God when we can when we can love in that way. And so I think the more, I guess if I would say anything, the more that you can be intentional and take time to just reflect even on your relationships, um, it's only going to help. Um, so why not, right? Every now and then, every six months, once a year, just do some reflection and see see where it gets you. Absolutely. And, you know, Regina, if, if I if I may, I'm going to try to make a little theological leap here. Um, okay. So, so, you know, you talk about relationships and trust, building trust, right? And that's difficult. And, you know, Proverbs says, guard well the heart for it is the wellspring of life. So I think part of that is as you're building a relationship, you're getting a sense of can I trust this person with my total self, right? Um, but then our Lord has done that with us through the Eucharist. Mm. He has given himself completely and fully to us. So he's modeling for us how to entrust 
ourselves to someone else. And you make a great point in the book too, how it takes two to tango and, and we can completely entrust ourselves to someone else. It doesn't mean someone else is going to reciprocate that. And our Lord's example, he gave everything, even when we don't uh, follow him perfectly, even when we still make mistakes, he's still saying, here I am and giving himself to us. So he models Absolutely. it for us each and every day. Beautiful. Yes. I mean, it's a great model for forgiveness, but also just extending ourselves beyond that comfort zone. Absolutely. Well, thank you, Regina. Thank you for this gift of this book. I encourage everyone to read it, Leaving Loneliness Behind, published by Ave Maria Press. We will uh, certainly put it in the show notes. And there's also a study guide that goes with it. Is that right, Regina? Yes, there's a workbook. So there's a corresponding chapter for each chapter in the book so that you can dive deep. You mentioned the relationship roadmap. There's roadmap questions in the workbook, opportunities for you to track and implement, you know, who's which relationship am I going to focus on this week or this month? And you can say what you tried, what progress did you notice afterwards? So it's a nice, again, practical way to really implement some of these tools and see your fruitfulness over time unfold. And would you say for that study book, is it uh, more for individual use? Can it be also done in groups? Maybe couples do those things together? What, do you, what would you recommend or all of the I, above? I would say all of the above. I think it's great individually. I think it's awesome as a couple to do it individually, have a conversation about it. I think you could even do a group study together with people. Um, so all of the above. There's awesome. also um, videos that you can watch as well. There's the QR codes in the back of the books. And it, as a group, people could watch the video that goes with each chapter and then dive into the workbook. So that, that is awesome. So many tools. Well, thank you again for this gift, folks. Thank you for listening. Check out the book and we'll see you next time on Being and Making Disciples. God bless.